Welcome to the front office. I am Bobby Marks, and today I am joined by Mike Tannenbaum, the uh, NFL front office insider for ESPN, former general manager of the New York Jets, and executive vice president for football operations with the Miami Dolphins. Mike, thanks for joining me. Bobby, great to be with you, and uh, I know you're my counterpart on uh, the basketball side of things, and proud to be your first cousin at ESPN. <laughs> well, I figured we'd do something a little bit different here. Of course, Mike is not a GM of an, <clears throat> of an NBA team like we've had with um, John Horst and Kobe Altman in, in prior interviews. And with the NFL offseason um, kicking in, I figured we'd bring Mike on and talk about uh, a little bit about kind of what goes on behind the scenes uh, from an NFL perspective. But before I wanted to do that, I wanted to kind of just talk about a little bit about your journey as far as you getting into uh, the, the NFL. You went to UMass, Amherst, uh, a proud alum. Um, I saw you did an internship with the Pittsfield Mets um, as far as your kind of get into sports. And, you know, that correlated into working for the Browns, the Saints, the Jets. Um, the Dolphins, uh, eventually kind of a, an in-between there with, uh, and, and the agency part um, with Priority Sports uh, as an agent. And the one word I always talk about is kind of opportunity, kind of getting your foot in the door when I'm talking with, with kids here. Talk, talk about your first opportunity as far as the, the, the first break that you caught uh, when you broke into sports. You know, Bobby, I think it's the same principles if we were running a, a dry cleaner in Naples, Florida, ESPN, Brooklyn Nets, New York Jets, it's all about creating value. And like, why you? What, what do you do to differentiate yourself? And, and I've, I've talked on this topic quite a bit. And, and my journey is really a story of luck. I just try to pass along some lessons that hopefully people can benefit from un <coughs> how unbelievably uh, lucky I was. Um, and basically, my story was about in pro football for the first 75 years, players couldn't move teams. Um, and there was a lot of litigation in the 70s, 82, 87, there were strikes. And in 93, there was this big class action settlement. And basically, players were able to become free agents and the owners got cost certainty in something called the salary cap. And literally overnight, people that worked in front offices changed from former players and coaches to people that had JDs and MBAs. And at the time, I was getting my law degree at Tulane. And at the time, the only professional sports team in the city of New Orleans was New Orleans Saints. So here I am at Tulane Law School. There's a, literally a once in a 75 year event. There's one team in the entire city of New Orleans where I'm going to law school and it happens to be football. So I was able to start as an unpaid intern. And for a year and a half, I just took notes, how to build a team, understanding the cap. And I sent out a book on, on how to do that. And, um, I sent out 60, I got 59 rejection letters and uh, <laughs> coach Belichick hired me in Cleveland and that's how I got started. Now you mentioned, uh, I mentioned that you did, you know, your probably your longest tenure was in New York working uh, with, with the Jets. Um, one of the people there was Bill Parcells. Um, talk about your relationship with coach Parcells and kind of the biggest lesson that you learned, you know, working with him. Yeah, uh, I can't, can't tell you how much, uh, how lucky I am to call him a, a friend, a boss, a teammate, a mentor. Um, I don't think a day goes by, I don't think about some lesson that he didn't teach me. And if I had to boil it down to one, I think it's just like the relentless pursuit of greatness. You know, it's funny, we're, we're doing this podcast on Friday morning. I landed at 1 a.m. last night from Mobile, Alabama, covering the senior bowl. And um, what's interesting is, like, I come in late night from a trip, and I think about Bill because he used to have a rule when you traveled that you had to come back to the office, you had to do your expense report, because the next morning he wanted that day to be as productive as possible. So his there's a million things we can talk about with Coach, but I would just say the number one thing is there's no excuses, and you're either going to win or go home. And it doesn't matter how you get it done. As many people don't know, Mike was actually a tenant of uh, the legendary 390 Murray Hill Parkway. He had a corner office on the first floor. He had a great fish tank in there. I, I, that was why I, I, 
I always said to Mike when I went to go visit him at the Nets practice facility, I was upstairs, Mike was downstairs. I would come to see the fish tank. It was really because I wanted to talk football with Mike. Um, but Mike was a tenant there. He was working for uh, Priority Sports as an agent representing coaches, Steve Kerr, one of his clients. How about, how about that transition going for, from something that you did all your life working in the NFL to now kind of you know, shifting gears working on the agency side? Of a landlord, and one of the things I used to do, Bobby, that I don't think I ever shared. I guess you can break this news is you know, you and Billy King were nice, but you know, I didn't really know exactly like where my rhythm was in terms of like what was acceptable. So, like, sometimes like you guys would serve lunch to the staff, and there was one of the guys that worked with me, and you guys certainly never invited me to join you for lunch, so I didn't necessarily feel welcome, but I also felt like, well, if there's lunch there, hey, maybe we could just kind of pick at things. So, we would used to like you know, sort of sneak in once you guys like went back upstairs. So I'm like thinking like, here I am, like I just ran an NFL team. I was there for 16 years and now I'm sneaking in lunch at 390 Murray Hill Parkway. Cause I'm not really sure. Like as nice as Billy King was to me, he never like said, Hey, join us for lunch. So, um, you know, I, I kind of did that. Like uh, we, we sort of like approached lunch in, in a very guarded way. Well, you know what? I'll blame Kevin Garnett for that because when we had Kevin for <laughs> the 13, 14 and for part of 14, 15, Kevin had a rule that the staff, including coaches, were not allowed to eat lunch with when they were in there. And I want, I remember walking in one time and having a plate and he kind of like just looked at me with that death stare. And from that point on, what, what happened was my office was on the second floor. I would wait for Kevin Garnett to leave the practice. I could see him pull out before I can go downstairs to get my lunch. So I will blame, we'll blame Kevin Garnett for you not getting lunch at, um, at our, our practice facility. Kevin's listening. If he wants to throw me, you know, like a $50 gift card to like an Apple or something to make <laughs> up for it. And we can just call it even that, that, that would work for me. But was there getting back to the agency side, was there an adjustment period? Like when, you know, it was for me at least post nets, like when you're not doing something that you love, anymore at least in a, in a short term where like you've got to kind of create your own niche again or kind of you're in a holding pattern waiting for that next job but was there a transition period just to be home right like we're never we were never really home um you know post you know post working for the jets yeah that's uh, such an interesting question bobby that we could talk about for hours because it still goes through my mind all the time and um I started a group called 33rd Team, which is a bunch of GMs, head coaches between opportunities. Uh, proudly this morning, we just had somebody graduate, uh, Doug Peterson, who uh, is going back to the Jaguars. We had Dan Quinn. And what we found is there's sort of like this platform where you have graduate students who are really, really smart, who um, you know could really just want to do anything to get their foot in their door. And then you have people like yourself, myself, people, in our case, Eric Mangini, John Fox, Dirk Cutter, like I said, Dan Quinn, Doug Peterson, Mark Trussman. We have about 50 of us, and we have a call every Wednesday at 5 o'clock. And it's about staying current, going over the officiating, going over rules, going over, you know, a myriad of things. And I think it's a way for everyone to stay current and, and continue to be the best version of themselves. And, you know, we talk about this a lot on the call, like, you know, while our logo right now, you know, we don't have a logo on our jersey, that doesn't mean – that we're not still trying to be the best version of ourselves and compete. Um, and one of the things we, we frequently uh, kind of talk about, Bobby, is, you know, the key to life is what you learn once you know it all. Outside of, um, of course, hiring a head coach, and we, we see that in the NFL, and there's still vacancies uh, open. Um, you know, every year it feels like that Monday after the season's over, there's like eight or nine openings. Um, outside of hiring the head coach and the NFL offseason is a little bit different than the NBA where we've got the draft and then free agency where kind of the NFL is kind of flip-flopped here. Um, talk to me a little bit about the offseason when it comes to the, um, the NFL and how important does the draft become when, you know, that's down the road in, in May, the importance of, of the draft here. Well, you know, the Rams are going to try to flip that a little bit on its head. They still have a lot of younger players on their roster, not obviously in the first round, given all the draft picks they give away, but, and they deserve a lot of credit because they've really like bucked the system and it looks like it's working. You know, they're getting back to a Super Bowl, but 
to have really like systemic, consistent success that's sustainable with a process, you, you have to hit on at least three to four picks a year because, you know, similar to the NBA with a salary cap, Bobby, that is your only mechanism to get good young players at, at the right price. And <clears throat> to me, you can't get certain positions. There's always an exception or two, but the pass rushers, the corners, the quarterbacks, you know, you don't ever really hear of like, hey, here's a high character, productive, in his prime, healthy quarterback that's going to be available in free agency. That just doesn't happen. So there's like certain premium positions you really have to draft. Like there'll be the exception of a Jalen Ramsey getting traded or, you know, same things with pass rushers or, or quarterbacks. So you really have to hit on those positions in the draft. You were just in, in Mobile, Alabama for um, Senior Bowl week. Um, you know, teams are are in the offseason right now with, you know, certainly an emphasis on free agency and then and then the draft. Just walk me through kind of what teams are going through right now. Um, you know, not on a, a, a day-to-day basis, but what what is like kind of the, you know, is there is there even an off-season where teams are kind of, you know, taking a week or two off or are they in kind of full, you know, full roster evaluation mode? It's a little bit of, of a few things. First of all, you got to get your coaching staff set. So no, most notably, obviously, with the head coach searches, but more fundamentally, Bobby, you know, there's oftentimes some changes. So you're working on that. And then, you know, anytime, and I'm sure this applies to the NBA, to have success, you have to correctly identify your own. One of the things we used to do, uh, Coach Parcells was a big believer in, was when a new staff takes over, oftentimes they'll misevaluate their own. And so they spent a lot of time looking at their outdoor. Um, like we'll study the other team's decision making and we'll look at teams that players have left their organization, gone someplace else and done well. So we're constantly looking at those sort of opportunities. And then free agency, which is when a player's been in the league for four more years and his contract has expired. That's the first day of the league year, which will be in early March. So this time of year in early uh, February, you go into the All Star games, as you mentioned. We just had the senior bowl, which is the most notable one. And then after that, we'll um, transition to the combine. And then from the combine, go into free agency, free agency into the draft. Do you put a lot of stock into um, the ability to meet with players, personality? Um, Certainly what you see a guy running the 40 in or some of their individual, um, but how much I guess it's a two-part question. The, the ability to meet with them, their personality, and how much is the value of tape, what, their body of work, as far as what they did in college? One of my big beliefs in life, Bobby, is who you are is how you treat people that can't help you, the waiter, the waitress, the bus driver. And I'll tell you a great story, uh, Laramie Tunsil. So it's the 2016 draft. We're at the Dolphins. We had a, a good, not great tackle uh, in Brandon Albert, and we had eight gazillion other needs, corner, defensive lineman. The number one player on our board was Larry Tunsil. And um, right shortly before the draft, a video came out of him doing something, you know, he probably wasn't proud of smoking marijuana, but it was on video. Uh, he had a gas mask on and it was, you know, I would just say alarming from a sort of like image standpoint. So again, he's the number one player on our board and somehow, some way he fell 13 and we took him and we thought it was the greatest opportunity one of the reasons we thought it was a great opportunity was we had great reports on Laramie Tunsil, like great teammate at Ole Miss, really great relationship with his mother. Um, and obviously he was a good person that made a mistake. And uh, so we took advantage of it. We got a really good player um, at 13. And again, we had a good process. Like we had talked to the support staff at Ole Miss. And, and to me, that's so important because again, people are going to be nice to their head coach. They're going to be nice to, you know, people that are making decisions. But someone's true character is how they treat people when no one's looking. No, that's a good point. And I think what, what happens, at least, you know, from my experience in, in New Jersey and Brooklyn, is sometimes you, you talk yourself into a pick, even though there's already kind of red flags there for that player, because that sometimes the talent um, outweighs the character of, of the player. Certainly in this case, uh, this was different. I mean, we had a situation in, in New Jersey where, um, right before the draft, we had gotten tipped by a team that uh, a prospect was working out and they found some paraphernalia in his room, marijuana. 
And we had already known that player had a history and there was already red flags about his character and he fell in the draft. And there was a reason why he fell in the draft. And although we picked him in the second round and it was kind of a limited risk, he was out of the league in two years, you know, never to be, never to be seen. And I think that's sometimes the challenge as far as kind of the talent on the court or on the field, their character and kind of putting, you know, putting those two things to, together there. You know, it's so funny. Rex Ryan used to talk about um, when he addressed the team. He's like, you guys are great athletes, but you're not the best athletes on the planet. He, and he, he was very compelling when he talked about this, Bobby. He said, you know, the best athletes on the planet in baseball, basketball, football, they're walking the streets. The ones that are sitting in these seats are great players that have the discipline to perform at a high level on a consistent basis. And uh, to your point about that player working out and, and, you know, not being able to stop smoking, like it's, it, it's something that we talk quite a bit about, um, you know, just from a standpoint that people make mistakes, people are going to have bumps in the road. You want to work with them. Clearly in my career, we've taken risks. Some have worked out, some haven't, but it's all based on, you know, I think, and there's no magic formula. It's, a, but it's about character and talent. And I think sometimes you could take more risks. You know, one of the guys that, um, I study a lot, a guy named Jack Welsh. He was a longtime CEO of uh, General Electric, great leader. He couldn't get into Marist, so he had to go to UMass like myself. <laughs> and uh, But one of the things he talked about was <clears throat> in any organization, there's four quadrants. And basically, the high character, the high talent people, that's your bedrock, that's your foundation. And the better that foundation is, you can take risks with people that are talented, but maybe their character isn't aligned. And that's something that as a leader or manager, you should be thinking about a lot. It's a great, that's a great point. It's a great lesson. Also, um, you touched a little bit on, on team, two teams that are in the Super Bowl, um, the Rams and, and the Bengals, totally two different ways how they've built their roster here where, you know, Cincinnati right through the draft with uh, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, T Higgins. Uh, I think they've only, they only made one trade that, that added a player and it's been through the draft. Um, you know, certainly free agency. And then you look at the Rams kind of like I, I said, I always compare, like I, I look at the Memphis Grizzlies, Grizzlies as the Cincinnati Bengals, kind of that homegrown product kind of built through the draft. And then you've got the Rams who are basically all in, right? They're, they're all in as far as you mentioned how they've dra- uh, traded draft picks here, Matthew Stafford, Odell Beckham, Von Miller, you know, Jalen Ramsey trade, um, and their draft picks are depleted, but at the end of the day, they're in the Super Bowl. Like, is there a right way to build it, or it doesn't matter as long as you kind of get to that, you know, get to an opportunity to, to win a championship? Yeah, Bobby, it's a, it's a fascinating question because there was a lot of people that were skeptical on how they were building their team. Candidly, you know, I'll raise my hand as a skeptic, but, you know, because we use the cliche that football is, you know, uh, <clears throat> hey, we're the ultimate team sport. Well, let me tell you, like, maybe we're not. And if the Rams win, you know, a week from Sunday, Bobby, um, <clears throat> it could change the discussion of like, do you have five to eight meaningful pieces and then fill in with everybody else? So it's, it's really an interesting discussion that um, give Les Snead, their GM, Sean McVay. Um, now, even if they do win, <clears throat> and we've both been through this, Bobby, does the mental toughness of the owner, can he hang in there? Because in two years, they're going to be bills to pay when they don't have picks. And no matter how good you may be on the back end, it, does, it just doesn't matter. So um, it, you're going to be bereft of talent. So one, can you win it all? We're going to find that out in, in nine days. But secondly, when the, the non-sustainable part comes and that day will come, you know, can the owner hang in there? And I think that's to be a really fascinating discussion. Well, in, in the case of, if, in Cincinnati, you know, when you hit on a pick like Burrow or um, Buffalo with, with Josh Allen, like those type of players, like if you get it right at the quarterback position, that can give you sustainable success for, I would think, for, for the future where you can keep on adding, you know, each year. Yeah, no, that's it. That, that, that's exactly right. I mean, there's a few bedrock pieces. And to me, you know, I've made this sort of point somewhat facetiously, but not completely, which is if I'm the Bengals, win or lose a week from Sunday, I'm sending the whole building home until trading camp. I'm keeping my personnel director and the offensive line coach, and I'm drafting like nine offensive linemen. <laughs> because, Bobby, 
if they don't protect this guy, it doesn't matter. Like you could put the U S Olympic track team on the outside. It doesn't matter. You have a chance to win the super bowl. You have a bright, young, high character, talented quarterback. Keep him healthy. Well, especially a player coming off an ACL from a couple of years ago and was basically running for his life in that Kansas city game at, at the end, um, who basically made some big plays on his feet, not on, on his arm. And you're right. I think that's the, you know, for, for the, from the outside, you're looking like, man, you better protect this guy because he's your, he's your long-term investment here. hundred percent. It's, it's non-negotiable. Um, so after your tenure in Miami uh, ended, you transitioned to the media. What's been a couple, I guess it's a two-part question here. What, what was the biggest challenge for you going from working in a front office to doing what you're doing now, either on TV or from a writing aspect? What, what did you f- find most challenging? Um, it's funny. I had a conversation with Chris Collinsworth about this, and he, he, he told a funny story that will really illustrate the answer, which is he said, like, early on, you know, he's involved. They own Pro Football Focus, and they have – a grading system and then you know he'll have production meetings and player x will walk in and if player x doesn't like the pff grade you know chris is going to hear about it and i don't know about you bobby but like for me i feel like getting more comfortable just to speak my mind and i think my sort of like uh breakthrough of uh like bill o'brien made this trade for laramie tunsil and um like a moment where as the GM, he kind of made a mistake. He didn't sign Larry Tunsil to an extension. And it was just, I couldn't go call plays for the Houston Texans. And he certainly wasn't qualified to be a GM. He's a talented coach. And it was sort of like this, like defining moment, Bobby. And I had to do, you know how it is. Hey, we need you on sports center. And I just kind of ripped the bandaid off. I'm like, <laughs> this is just totally unacceptable. Like you can't do this. Like, you cannot trade for a player and give up two first round picks and not sign them to an extension. Like the, the way the rules work, not to get too complicated, but if we're going to trade for Bobby Marks within, before we make the trade official with the other team, we could talk to you about an extension and then we could go back to the team and say, we're not making the trade. Yeah, so, no, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, you know, so you, you it, don't make the trade. Yeah, you don't make the trade until you know that you have the extension done because if not, you just gave the player a blank check. And that's exactly what happened. He like beat the next highest tackle by like five million a year. It would be like me putting on a headset on game day and saying, Hey, you know, we're gonna we're gonna run you know the screen pass on you know third and twenty, and expect to get a first down. Like I'm not qualified to be an NFL play caller. Bill O'Brien wasn't qualified to be an NFL GM, and he made this egregious mistake. And I think up until that point, I was sort of like you know, dancing on the margins, if you will. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Like, they're paying me. I got to be a pro. Like, I could look Bill O'Brien in the eye and tell him, like, yeah, I think you made a massive mistake and you made a mistake for something you weren't qualified for. Yeah, no, I mean, that's 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 a great point. I mean, just looking back on, you know, my time with ESPN, it, you know, when I first started, I, you know, and I still have a, I have a ton of friends in this in this business here. And it's, the one thing is when you work for a team, you're set, you're sensitive, right? You're sensitive to what the media says about you um, and teams would call you on it. Um, my goal was always to be fair, right? Fair and give my opinion. And I, I guess my, my moment of truth was in 2019 after um, Durant, Kevin Durant had left the Golden State to go to Brooklyn and um, Clay Thompson was injured. I was doing a segment with, uh, with Greeny on Get Up about the Warriors and it, about kind of what the off season was going to look, look like. And I said it out loud and I never told anybody where I said, golden States, this roster right now is not making the playoffs next year. And you know, at when, at, when you say something like that at ESPN, like the fire alarms go off, right? Like ding, ding, ding. Like we've got content for all day. And, and Greeny was like, not the playoffs, not even as an eight scene. I'm like, no, I'm looking at this roster draft pick. And I was crucified for it. Like I was, you know, by people within ESPN and I had um, somebody from sports center who oversees sports center came and sat with me that night. And he said, you own it now. Like, this is you, like you say that it's great content, but now you have to, now you have to believe in it. What you said, like, you're not going back on like, you know, well, maybe they're a playoff team or if they get, no, like you said it, 
you own it. And that's kind of been going forward for the last three years is that I'm always going to be fair with teams, but I'm also going to give an opinion because that's what people want. People want to know about the Lakers and their roster and why they can't add parts or why I think um, the Knicks roster is list. I call it listless and lethargic yesterday. I'm being, I'm just actually just being true. I have no, nothing against these organizations, but I think that's, what's important about our business is that you got to tell the truth based on your experiences and kind of what, you know, what the reality is. Well said, that's exactly it. And I think as long as you stay to the facts or have an opinion based on facts, like, I think that's a pretty safe space to be. And, you know, I, I think I probably have like, you know, you know, ruffled some feathers, but you know, like I know who my friends are. I'm proud of it. And, um, you know, I feel like I have a job to do. And again, I, I try to, you know, just stick to the facts. You mentioned earlier, uh, and we're going to wrap this up in, in a bit, in a minute here, but you mentioned earlier, um, about the 3013. Um, it's an NFL think tank. It's awesome. I mean, if, if you like the NFL or if you're just trying to you know, if you're kind of just figuring out what it is or you're new to it, um, you started it with Joe Banner, um, former uh, president of the Eagles and CEO of the Browns here. Um, can you just talk, talk to me a little bit about um, the goal when you started it and kind of how it's evolved right now? Yeah, I, I, it was really designed to help me get ready for the draft for ESPN. I, I do the uh, draft for ESPN radio. And um, I just, uh, going back to like 2006, I know how lucky I am. And I uh, started a scholarship for people that wanted to pursue their dreams, but couldn't afford to work for free. And uh, we gave them stipends so they could not have to, you know, wait on tables or be a bartender. And um, from there, it was actually Jim Caldwell and Greg Schiano. They were between opportunities. They wanted to stay current. I'm like, you know, like I got 4,000 students that would help out to get their foot in the door. And we just started like having conversations and next thing you know, I'm like, Hey, let's have this weekly zoom and every five o'clock every Wednesday. And um, we'll just talk about, Hey, how do you talk to a player who's not vaccinated? How do you handle, you know, uh, we had Bill Pulling's son, Brian Pulling into a seminar. And how do you teach and reach people um, in this day and age? And he talked about how he doesn't have seats in his classroom anymore. Like they have bar stools and, we just try to stay current and be, you know, sort of like take people behind the scenes and be differentiated and uh, just learn and get better. And like Doug Pearson, here's a guy that won a Super Bowl and every Wednesday at five o'clock, the guy's taking more notes than any of us. And uh, I know Jacksonville is getting like a, a life learner and, and a great coach. Yeah, they, they are getting a good coach. And, and the site is awesome. I mean, I, I go on it regularly. I read. Uh, I haven't made one of those Wednesday Zoom calls yet, but I'm, I figure I need to get through the trade deadline first. And then maybe when we get into uh, into late, uh, late February, I will definitely, uh, definitely jump on it. But it's a it's an awesome site. And uh, I want to thank you for coming on the front office. Uh, I know you're a busy man there. Uh, a lot going on uh, in the NFL. And I, I want to thank you for, for, for your time and everything, Mike. Thanks, Bobby. Really appreciate it. Thank you.